Hey. Hey, what is up, everyone? How are y'all doing tonight? Y'all good? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hey, well, I am so excited that y'all are here with us. I mean, honestly, like, especially after a worship set like that, I just want to say to y'all, that it is a huge privilege to be here and be able to worship with y'all. And that's my daughter in the back. So, uh... <laughs> So real quick, um, in case you, uh, this is your first time here or I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Tyler Webb, and I'm the Associate Youth Director here on staff. And I am so excited to be with you. Uh, if I haven't said that enough already, I, it really is true. I love being here at youth. So um, in case this is your first time or you've lost track of what's going on, we are currently in the tail end, kind of wrapping up our series, our February series of relationships, respect, and what is the third part? Red flags. Hey. <laughs> Sometimes when you uh, have two R's down, you forget the third one. So I totally forgot about that one. And also, I was telling Jeremiah before this, I keep saying them in different orders, so it didn't really stick to me. But I, I promise you, I do know what series we're in. Um, but with all that being said, uh, we're trying to, uh, tonight I'm going to give you hopefully one last little piece of wisdom in this whole complicated conversation we call relationships. And as complicated as it is, we truly do believe here that it's very important to have and it's very important, one, that we have it here in this church, and then very important, too, that we actually try to talk about it, because we believe it is important to have, and we also believe that Scripture speaks into it, so we want you to have that conversation here in the church before you have it anywhere outside in the real world. So, with all that being said, real quick to kind of kick things off tonight, I want to ask all of you a question. I want you to think back to a time in your life, and I want you to think of something that used to be your prized possession. And now when I say something is a prized possession, I'm talking about something that it could be an article of clothing, it could be a hat or accessory or anything that you have that you would wear all the time, that you brought with you everywhere you went, something that carried with you, and that honestly that people would know that you have or you're known for it. So real quick, I'd just love to hear some of y'all's prized possessions. What used to be a prized possession in your life? Feel free to raise your hand or shout it out. I promise I'll hear it. Yes. A stuffed animal, yeah, that's a very important one. That's so true. What's another one? What are some other good prized possessions? I'll tell you mine afterwards. Phone? Phone's a close one. Phone's a tricky one, though, because we have to have it to communicate. I don't really want to call it a prized possession, but it is a good one. Yes, Drayden. Huh? A dinosaur. Any certain type or just dinosaurs in general? Just dinosaurs. I get that, dude. Any other prized possessions? What are some other things that you had with you all the time? Yeah. Come on. Steve. You had Stevie as a prize. Nice. Any other prize possessions? We'll take one more. Yes, Hannah. Baby blanket. Baby blanket. Yeah, those are so important. You have them all the time when you're growing up and so important to you. And so the crazy thing about all these different items was that for one time in our life, they meant so much to us. For me personally, it was honestly my Game Boy Advance. Like if I was in school, i tried try to sneak it in. If I was going to family events like Thanksgiving or Christmas, I would always bring it with me. And honestly, as much as I love my family, there would be times in my life where I just kind of wanted to sneak away and just kind of be hunched over playing my Game Boy if I'm being completely honest. I try to bring that with me everywhere. But the crazy thing about prized possessions or any of those things is that at one point in our life, they seem to have a lot of value. But then what's crazy about it is as we grew up or as we got older, it was like one day they were the most important thing that we had in our life, and then the next morning they were just gone. Maybe they were donated, maybe they were sold away, or we just did not have them anymore. And the crazy thing about a prized possession or what's true about things like that is sometimes we give something value based on what it can give us in return. Sometimes we deem something as important based off what we get back from that. And as crazy as that sounds, sometimes we actually let that spill over into how we treat those around us. Sometimes we give someone a high value based on what they give us back in return, but at the end of the day, when they seem to not be able to give us anything, well, that's when we start to treat them as less important. And sometimes without realizing it, we can do this all the time, or maybe we don't even know that we're doing it. But when it comes to sex, dating, and relationships, that's a very important thing to talk about because the way we treat those around us actually matters. The way we treat people who we're attracted to or who we want to pursue in a dating life, it matters all the time. It's never not going to matter. That's a very big truth in this world. And it's one of the things that we can't skip past. It's something that we can't just gloss over. The way we treat other people is always going to matter. And here's the thing. It's, it's one of those things where we can't miss it out because sometimes we kind of tip to that line where we can start to think about people in a very dishonoring or unvaluable way. 
But let me hear this and be perfectly clear. It's okay for you to be attracted to someone. It's okay for you to have feelings for someone. That is okay. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. But what I'm trying to say and what we probably all can agree on in here is that there comes a line, there comes a kind of place that we don't want to cross. But once we start crossing that line, we kind of start diving into territory that's disrespectful and unhonoring of the people we're talking about or thinking about. It could be something that we start saying comments or making remarks about their bodies. Maybe it's something where we make comments or talk about their personalities or what they're like. Or maybe it's also one of those things where we start to kind of ask them for pictures or try to try and cross a line with them on social media. Or ultimately, maybe it's one of those ways where we start asking them to cross boundaries that they're not comfortable to cross. And also, it could be one of those things where you're comfortable saying it to their face or even more comfortable saying it behind their back. Or maybe you don't want to say it at all, but your thought life is just disgusting to the point where you don't even want to tell them, let alone let anyone around you know what you think about the other person. And when we don't treat people with value, we will automatically end up treating them like objects. Objects that at one point in our life could be very valuable, but in the next moment, they are completely worthless to us. It's a truth that's always going to be out there in the way we treat and value people. And when we don't, when we treat someone like an object, we don't give them that value. And I honestly can say that I believe that you'd say this too, that deep down, all of us desire to be valued and respected in all of our relationships. And if we want that for ourselves, why wouldn't we not want to give that to those around us? But I want to stop right there, and I want to say this loud and clear for all of us to hear, and I need you to hear this because it's very important, that each and every person in here was made by God, and because of that, you have value. That's always going to be true. You are made in the image of the God of the universe, and that will never change about you. And you do not have to give that up or let that suffer in any relationship or anything that you are entering into. But it's one thing to stop and kind of know and try to believe that people are created by God and they have value, but it's another thing to actually live that out and to actually treat people with value. And so to kind of dial in on that and try to focus in on how to answer that question in our daily lives, uh, the best place to start is with Scripture. So if you would like to follow along, we're going to be in 2 Samuel, starting in chapter 11, and we're going to be focusing mainly on kind of the first half of the story that's in there. And though it could be a story that you may have heard countless times, I honestly pray that you will not tune out and that you will listen for something new tonight. And I pray that that will be the right answer for you in your own way. So real quick, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into the rest of the the story. So uh, God, we come for you now. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for blessing the musicians with talent and to guide us into our heart of worship, to worship you. Father, we love you and we thank you. Lord, I pray that you will uh, be with me tonight, and I pray that you will speak through me. Lord, your servant is listening. Use me to say what I need to say, what you need to say. Father, I also pray that you will be at the hearts and the minds of the students in here. I pray that you will open them to hear what you want to tell them. Father, you are supreme, or you reign supreme on this earth, and you reign supreme in this room tonight. So I pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, to kind of give some context to the story we're about to dive into, we're going to be in the Old Testament, and we're going to be focusing on the main kind of king we think about when we think of Israel, and that is King David. And to kind of play a game real quick of some kind of word association, when I say King David, what are some of the thoughts that come to your mind right now when I say King David? What does anything th- what anybody think of? Mouse, sheep. Mouse, sheep, yes. David and Goliath, yeah, that's a great one. Anything else? When I say King David, what's some of the first things that come to your mind? Yeah. What <laughs> creep? Yeah. He was a ginger. He was ruddy and some times called handsome in scripture. That's right. What are some other things that you think of when you hear King David? Like one or two more good ones. Just to get some variety. My, yeah. So all those, yeah, so all those are true. All those things we think about when we think of David, all those come to mind. And most importantly, the one that we probably always think about is David and Goliath. When we think of David's highlight reel, that's sometimes the first thing we go to because we also see that whole story kind of recreated in movies and TV shows of this whole underdog overcoming impossible odds and kind of succeeding there at the end. It's something we think about all the time. 
But I'm going to be focusing on another story that happened in David's life. And though you might have heard this one just as much as you might have heard David and Goliath, I pray that you find new insight and that you hear something new tonight in the story. So to kind of set the scene, David has been king of Israel for a while now. And in his reign, his kingdom is about to go to war with the Ammonites. And the Ammonites were this whole other people group who was kind of one of Israel's main enemies. And so here's how we find the story started out in verse 1 in chapter 11. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So what's interesting to see here, very off the bat, just right there, is that while David's army was going out to battle, and even though David was the king and it was literally his job to go with his men into battle, he stayed at home. He basically told his men, hey, y'all got it. I'm good, I'm gonna stay back home. I'll see y'all when you get back. And so we keep watching, and David one night just cannot sleep. And maybe it's because he's being torn up inside because he, he's not at war with his men. Or maybe it's, uh, and maybe some of you can relate to this, maybe it's like in the summertime for us when we're out of routine, we're out of school, and we just stay up all the time. Does anybody relate to that? Has anyone ever been that place in your life in the summertime? I know I have at times. It's one of those things where when we're not in school and we're out of our routines and our hobbies start getting boring and even our screen time goes way high, which doesn't help at all. And because of that, we become kind of stir crazy and we lose sleep. And now scripture doesn't tell us exactly why David can't sleep, but this is where we find him. And he's out surveying his whole kingdom from his palace. And while he's there, he notices a woman bathing on her roof. Now, Pause. A little side note here. As odd as this may sound, that is actually completely normal for them because you got to realize that they don't have indoor plumbing. They don't have any kind of waterworks. And so the way it worked back then is that any time it rained, they would collect all the water on their roof in different kind of containers to use for different purposes. And also scripture says that she's bathing in the evening. So it's not like David should have seen her, but because he's up and he's not asleep, this is where he kind of walks into And so the first thing I want to note here in the story is this, is that sometimes the most dangerous place for any of us to be is at a place we should have never been at to begin with. And so David then acknowledges her beauty, and he wants to know more about her. And because he's the king, he can do that. And look where we pick back up in verse 3, and it says this. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So I want to say here real quick, I truly hope that when any of you in here start to act on kind of untamed desires, that you have someone close to you in your life that will tell you the truth and the complete whole truth. Because right here, this messenger, he doesn't just come back with a name for David. He tells him everything. He basically says this, he's like, hey, I know you wanted to know more about her because you're attracted to her, but hey, at the end of the day, she is not an object for you to have. You see, she has a name a family, but most importantly, she is someone's wife, so she is not yours. David, of course, in his desires kind of falls into some of the same assumptions that we can fall into when we start to get into a dating life, which is these three things. I am the exception to the rules. What I want isn't that bad, actually. And honestly, I can deal with whatever comes out of my own choices. Sometimes we can think that. And we try to sometimes justify ourselves or even become the best lawyer we know. But all the time when we're doing that, we're ultimately choosing ourselves over God. Because at the end of the day, neither David nor us are above right or wrong. There are actually real consequences that we will have to deal with. And we can't avoid them. And we can't just blame our desires and say, oh, well, it wasn't my fault. I had these desires. No, you can't do that. And David, while in a moment where he has a chance to kind of stop everything, own up to what he's done, and make things right, or start to get on that process, he ends up actually spiraling further and further out of control. On two separate occasions, he brings Uriah back off the battlefield, and he says, look, look, you're one of my mighty men. I need you to take a break from the battle. I need you to go home and kind of let nature take take its course, because he had brought Bathsheba to the palace And he had a one-night stand, and there was a pregnancy. And so David was doing everything he could to try to hide this. And so he brought Uriah home, like I said, two different occasions. But Uriah had so much honor, and he was not going to leave his men behind and sleep in a comfortable arrangement with his wife. 
And so after those two failed attempts, David, out of final desperation, he says, look, here's what we're going to do. He sends word to his soldiers. He says, look, when you go into battle, make sure you send Uriah to the front lines. And when you do that, I need all of everyone else to pull back and basically leave Uriah out there to die because he had no help. He was alone on the battlefield. And David, he knew that that was the only solution because once he did that, Bathsheba would then be a widow and it would be acceptable for him to marry her and the pregnancy would all be believed by everyone else to be out of that marriage and not out of marriage. And so that's where we find that in the story. And, and it keeps going on and we've talked about it before. We've talked about Psalm 51. We've talked about how Nathan comes to David and we've talked about some of these things. But I want to real quick kind of cut the story short right there at that last little bit because I want to focus on something that sometimes we miss. No matter how many times you've heard that story, maybe it was the first time for you hearing it tonight, or maybe you've heard it tons of other times, it's easy for all of us to kind of dial in and focus on David's actions. Because he's called in Scripture and other times this man after God's own heart. And so we're like, well, well how could you do that? Or, or I would never do something like that. Like, what is David thinking? And while those are all accurate, real things to say, that's a true, honest reaction to the story Sometimes, like on your phone when you're trying to take a, a portrait setting picture and you're, you're f- so focused on what's in front of you, you start to let the whole background be blurred out. But I want us real quick to refocus on the story and actually think about it for a second because when we do that, the reality shows up that the value, respect, and humanity of Bathsheba was stolen from her. All throughout the story, we, we kind of gloss over by looking at David's actions that her life was sent into chaos. She faced heartache, she faced loss, and she faced just a horrible situation. But sometimes we just chalk her up to a background character. We chalk her up to just one of David's many wives, and she's only mentioned in this story. She's only mentioned as, as in tie into Psalm 51, but we don't actually focus on the actual heartache caused by David's actions. You see, sometimes we, we, know, we know the story and we can say it, but we don't realize that, that Bathsheba was one flesh with Uriah and that her husband was murdered. And not only that, she was also forced into the situation she had no ultimate control over. And there was heartache and there was all that suffering involved, but we don't see that sometimes. And we don't acknowledge that there's pain there. But in her story, we are taught a very valuable lesson. There are times when we want to chase after this desire and we're blinded to the act of actually valuing people around us. We're blinded to actually see the needs and the desires of those around us because we're so focused on chasing after what we want. And maybe you haven't been involved in as as extreme story as kind of David was right here, but maybe some of these might sound familiar to you. We believe that we wouldn't have regrets or, or we would never get caught. Or maybe we also believe that we can turn around and make it right. We can change what's going on. Or maybe we also believe that that no one understands the friendship I have. No one understands the relationship I'm in. They just don't understand that person I'm attracted to, so they just don't get it. Maybe some of those sounded familiar to you, and I hope that the dings are kind of making you focus in on what I'm trying to say, that it's kind of dialing in on that. But real quick, like, and when all that starts to happen, when we actually start to consider or we don't consider people's values, what happens at that moment is that we lose sight of them as a person, and we start to treat them, like I said before, as an object who only has value for us. When we start thinking that we're the exception to all the rules, when we start thinking that they have no rights, or we start thinking that what I want is supreme and there's no way that I should either consider anyone else, we become so us-focused that we're consumed by it to an ugly extent. And while this is a temptation we can all face, the reality is this. The pressure to be with someone can cause you to settle for anything. We end up settling for situations, people, or relationships that aren't really at all the best for us. And we can't lose sight of this because settling for anything can mean sometimes we just end up in a bad situation. And then we're just like, how did we get here? When all the while we just kept going after our own desires time after time. And ultimately we also don't realize that in our actions there's someone across the table from us who has been deeply hurt by our actions. There are consequences to the things we do sometimes, even if we choose not to see that. 
And so when it comes to relationships and friendships, because this series isn't just for those who are dating currently, it's also for single people because all acts of life matter and we don't want to just want to focus in on dial on one part because there's some of you in this room who might be getting ready to enter a dating phase or there's some of you right now who are single but also trying to look to the future of what it would look like to pursue someone who you would like to spend the rest of your life with. And so real quick, I'm going to try to give you some kind of red flags and green flags and some advice on that, and then want to hopefully give you some applications to try to imply, apply all this to your life, even though it's one small step at a time. We can't just do this just all at once and change. So real quick, let's start with this. Red flag, they diminish your value in a relationship, and they don't value the friendships around you. Green flag, they encourage you to know that you have value to God, others, and to yourself. When it comes to dating or friendships, if they constantly tear you down or try to get you to cross boundaries that you don't want to cross or start insulting the friends that you have important in your life, that's a red flag. No matter how you change up the situation, that is always going to be a red flag, especially if they try to force you to cross boundaries because of your faith. Let me just say this as clearly as possible as I can. Missionary dating should never be a thing for you. It's never going to work out. It's only going to end up in more heartache and more pain than you need to actually have to carry in your own life. You should be looking for someone who builds you up, who encourages you, who affirms you as being made in the image of God, and ultimately who wants to see you grow in your faith. That's what matters. That's what matters in this life, and you should be actively looking for those things. Now, this isn't just looking for some yes person. This isn't looking for someone who's going to affirm everything you do is great and just say, like, oh, yeah, you never do anything wrong. No, no, no. You should look for someone who will actively challenge you because they don't want you just to remain in your faith. They want to see you grow. And to grow, sometimes we have to step out of those areas of comfortability and actually step into the unknown. That's called faith. And then the next thing to look at is this. If they respect your value as someone beautifully and wonderfully made by God. I've said it countless times tonight, but I truly do need you to hear this. You are created in the image of the God of the universe. That will never change. Do not let any relationship or any friendship try to tarnish that image or try to take that away from you because that relationship or friendship may not be forever, but your imagery in the image of God will be a part of you every single day of your life. That won't change. And then the thing you should also look for in that aspect with people around you is you should look for people who speak to you, who treat you, who value you, who show you appreciation that you are made in God's image, and ultimately who look at you and love you for who you are and not wanting to change you into something else. Those are the type of people you need around you. And then the last thing to look at is this, is that when you're looking at relationships, no relationship, either romantic or friendship, should take you away from church, family, or friends. If you ever enter into a new relationship and they start to tell you that you need new hobbies or you need new activities, or even worse, if they tell you that you need new friends, that's a red flag. If you enter into a new group of friends and they start to make fun of the friends you used to hang out with right in front of you, that's a red flag. The only people in your life, boyfriend, girlfriend, or group of friends who have the ability to speak into your life and say you need new hobbies or new friendships are people who actually see that the things you're doing are toxic and they actually want what's best for you. But otherwise, no one else deserves that privilege because no one else can say those harsh or those hard of things because they don't know you that well. But if they're trying to speak into you that way, that's a red flag and you should want to notice that. And so as we take all of that into consideration, here is just a few of the applications I have for you. And the first is this, is that you need to find friends who speak life into you. And what I mean by that is, by life, I mean that someone is speaking gospel truth and affirmation into you to, to remind you that you are made in the image of God. You should also want people around you who actually want you to succeed and go far in life for all the right reasons. You need people that you can trust to speak truth into you through every situation, even if it may hurt at times. And no matter how social you may be out in here, no matter how unsocial you might be in here, I would say that all of you need to have at least three consistent friendships in your life that through thick and thin, they are ready to speak into your life and to encourage you in the right ways, but not but also to discourage you in the wrong ways. They should want to be able to hold you accountable, and you should be looking for that. Don't settle for someone who is an open book in every aspect of their life, but when it comes to dating relationships, they say, oh, no, 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 I can't let you into that, because that's selfishness. They don't truly see you as a friend, because at the end of the day, it's one thing to have a friend and actually 
to listen to them, but it's another thing to not listen to them. And when you don't listen to your friends, you end up in the same situation as David did, making decisions without any input or even ignored input. You need friendships. But also, wisdom just doesn't only come from close friendships. It also comes from those who are older who have lived life. I would challenge all of you to invest in your small group leader. And are any of the leaders in this room because they have lived a life and they would love to share the knowledge that they've learned so that you don't end up making the same bad decisions or mistakes that they made. Listen to those who've gone farther in life ahead of you. It's going to be very important. And the other thing to do is as you enter in uh, with any friendship or relationship, whether it's new or old, the second thing to do is this. Evaluate life changes because of a new relationship slash friendship. We understand that in any relationship, we may have this period in our life where we kind of call it the honeymoon phase where there's no wrong done. Everyone's happy, happy dory. There's nothing going wrong. There's no bad decisions being made. But if your friends or those who are close to you are saying that their alarm's being sounded off, or if they say there's red flags about that person that you need to acknowledge, then you actually might want to listen to them. Because the people closest to us actually will notice when we stop showing up to stuff or we start becoming more closed off than we ever have in our life. Maybe it's that you end up stop serving at church. Or maybe it's that you end up just not coming to youth altogether. Those things will not go unnoticed. Your friends who are close to you and know you the best, they will notice that. That won't go unnoticed. When you start becoming more closed off at small group, that's a red flag. They will start to notice that. And if you have to be willing and ready to listen to them, no matter how much it may hurt. No relationship is worth it if they want to tear you away from where you worship or from those who are closest to you in this life. You have to be ready and willing to listen to your friends. You can't go under the radar because otherwise you're going to start ending up making decisions or stop showing up to things like David did. Or maybe you might try to make decisions in the dark where no one will know and you think you're in hiding, but you're not. Those closest who know your heart will see and notice you. And then the last thing is this, work on treating yourself and others in a way that honors God. And the thing about this that I want you to think about real quick is that when you're on an airplane, they say that you have to put on your own oxygen mask first before you can further assist those who are around you. And so what I'm saying by that is when you get up in the morning, do you see yourself who actually deserves to be treated with value? Are the things you say to yourself in the mirror, is it actually uplifting and, and saying that you deserve to be treated well in this life? Because the thing to think about in this is that sometimes without even realizing it, the things or the things you say or think about yourself and anyone else would have been considered a red flag. But sometimes we give ourselves the okay because you're just talking to yourself. I mean, you'll overcome it. Like, yeah, I might be down on myself, but I'll get back up. But no, the things you say to yourself will stick. And that also has to stop. You have to see yourself as being valuable and worth being treated that way as well. And once you start doing that, it's going to be a lot easier to hold firm to all the boundaries that you have set for yourself in life. It's going to be easier for you to say, to stop someone from talking to you in a way that's not uplifting or not respectful at all. It's going to be a lot easier for you to block someone on social media who's just constantly begging you to send something that you don't want to send or make a decision that you're not willing to make. Or ultimately, too, once you know that you have value, then it's going to be a lot easier for possibly for you to break up with a relationship when they've been objectifying you for far too long. You have to see those things, and you have to give yourself value. But once you give yourself value, you must give it to other people. Maybe you stop making jokes about someone's body. Maybe you stop making jokes or snide remarks about someone's personality or who they are, and that's how God created them. Or maybe you also stop leading someone on by flirting just for attention. It's not worth it. It's also not uplifting whatsoever. Or maybe ultimately you stop pressuring someone to make a decision or cross a boundary that they aren't comfortable making that decision. Whatever it might be for you, find a way for you to show value to other people in your life in a way that honors God every single day of your life. And I'm telling you this because I want you to save on the heartache. And trust me, it's real. When I was in high school, there was a time in my life where I entered into a relationship that to kind of like hold off or to try to keep people safe in my life, I kept it a secret. I thought if, if I could just save them the trouble of worrying about it, if I thought if I could just protect them by keeping everything a secret, then it would all go all right. And eventually it got to a point where even my parents found out, and once they found out, there was just so much hurt. And this was on the eve of me going into college. So at, this, at the end of my senior year, this became just an untalked about subject at our house. And I go for three more years to college and for so long. And the first time I come back, my mom tells me, like, you have still not apologized for what you did. 
And it's something that I never realized that I had to do because I thought we just moved on. If you don't talk about it, then it's okay and everyone should be okay. But you don't realize the pain that you might be causing on the other end to people who are involved. Your friends want to be a part of your life. Your friends want to know what's going on in your heart. And especially your family wants to know what's going on with you. Don't try to close off because any relationship or any decision made in the dark and private without any input is never really going to be a great decision whatsoever. And I want to save you that pain of not only just five or ten years from now, but the pain and the shame and the heartbreak that may just be a week or month down the road. I want to try to save you from that because no one should have to endure that. But in the end, where, if you want to be where you want to be in dating and relationships and in life, the two things you have to know is you have to be honest with yourself, and you also have to let people in to be honest with you. Because ultimately, it remind, I, want you to remind, I want to remind you of this, is that the pressure to be with someone can cause you to settle for anything. But God doesn't want you to settle. God never created you to settle. He created you to have life and have life to the full. If you'll pray with me real quick. Father, I come for you right now. Lord, just to thank you. God, you are good. You know the good desires of our heart, and you want to grow those into a blossoming fruit. Father, I also pray right now that you speak to us in a way that only you know how our heart needs to be spoken to. Father, I pray that as we head into small groups, that you will guide the conversation. You will give strength to the leaders to be able to speak into whatever situ- situation may arise or come up. Father, ultimately, I pray that you will be with us this week, that we will begin to take the first step or whatever that may look like to actually show value to those around us, believing that they are truly in, created in your image, and we see that, and we acknowledge, and we value that in them. Lord, we love you, and thank you for what you're doing in this life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You are now free to go to small groups.